Hey everybody, it's Dr. Wyatt Fisher. I hope you are surviving and doing okay during this quarantine time. It's a crazy time in the world. A lot of us are frightened. We're not sure how to respond. And it's impacting marriages because most of us are not used to being home 24-7 with our partner. So I thought I would create this marriage survival guide while we're quarantined to help to make the most of this time and ideally even start to thrive during it. So the acronym we're going to be building is PEACE. That's what we all want during this time. We want to feel peace. And PEACE stands for Partitions, Exposure, Anxiety, Collaboration, and Engage. So during this Marriage Survival Guide, I'm going to walk through what each of these letters mean so that you can apply it in your own marriage. So the first one is Partitions. And as I'm sure you know, you're familiar with partitions in office spaces. A lot of times they'll put up some, some boards or some walls like we have in this picture here to divide space because it makes the functionality of the space more effective. And now that we're home full time, I want to encourage you to have partitions for your time. You need to consider how am I going to divide my time along several categories we're going to go over so that all the important areas are met. You need to be intentional about this and think about this and talk to your partner about this so that you guys are on the same page with how are we going to partition our time so that all of our needs are being met. The first area to consider is kids. So if you have kids, they're home full time with you. How are you going to partition your time with your kids? And that refers to who's going to be in charge of the kids. Who's going to be responsible for them? A lot of couples, what they're doing, if both partners are working full-time from home, is they divide up the child care 50-50. So partner A will be in charge, say, Monday, Wednesday, Friday of the kids, and partner B is in charge Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. Whatever it works, whatever works for your relationship, but consider how can we partition our time? How can we share child care responsibility if we're both home and we're both trying to get our work done? So to consider sharing the, the kids' responsibility. The next one is the work. So if you are both working full time and you have to manage your kids and now you have to also manage your work, how can that work for you? How can, how can you divide the time so that your work hours are being met and your partner's work hours are being met? You need to brainstorm on this and talk this through. So if you're in charge of the kids, perhaps that's the day you're not working, you're watching the kids and your partner's working and vice versa. The next day you're working and your partner's watching the kids or a little bit of both each day. But you have to brainstorm through this with your partner so that your needs for work are getting met. The next area for time partitioning is for family. When are you going to designate family time? You're with each other all the time, so that may feel like family time, but most of the time it's not because people are on tech, they're distracted, they're doing different things. So when I say family time, that's a time for everyone to power off their tech and to focus on each other. Do something interactive, like a game, You know, go outside and play around if you need to as a family, maybe go for a hike. Maybe there's a hiking trail that's not very populated near where you live. But family time is ideally regular daily time where you connect as a family and then perhaps once a, once a week where you have an extended time as a family. Maybe you prepare a meal together. Maybe you play ping pong. Then maybe you watch a movie. But consider partitioning your time so you're intentional with when you're going to have family time. The next is alone time. Some of us are introverted. Some of us are extroverted, and introverts are going bananas because they're with their family, their partner, and their kids 24-7 now, and that may be you. That's my wife. She's an introvert, and she is struggling having so much together time because we're a family of six. My wife and I and our four kids. I'm more extroverted, so it doesn't bother me as much, but you have to talk this through with your partner. How much alone time do you each need each day? to get your needs met. Maybe that's reading a book, or maybe it's taking a nap, or maybe it's going for a run. What do you need for alone time? How much time do you need daily? And then how can you take turns giving that to your partner intentionally? You need a partition for that. So you have a boundary, so you're both on the same page. The last one to consider a partition for is time for you as a couple. So when are you gonna be spending time together as a married couple during this quarantine? One option to recommend that I recommend is having every night around an hour together. 
So that's your time to connect, to talk, to play a game together, to cultivate your physical connection, but to have at least an hour every night after your kids are in bed ideally, or perhaps they're watching a movie, and then to try to have a home date once a week for an extended period of time where you have more time to connect and more time to focus on your relationship. If you're not intentional and setting a partition, that's not going to happen. So you have to have partitions for each of these so that you're creating structure within your house and you're both on the same page. So for your kids, for your work, for your family, for your alone time, and for you as a couple. Okay, that's step one, creating peace. You need a partition. Okay, the second piece of the peace acronym is the word exposure. So when I say exposure, this is referring to First of all, this analogy. So jewelers, when they want to heat up gold, they heat up gold to remove the imperfections in it. So you see this picture of these two rings. So if a jeweler wants to make their, their gold more pure and more fine and more valuable and more expensive, they heat it up. And when they heat it up, the imperfections in that gold rise to the surface. And then the jeweler can see the imperfections and remove them. And that makes the gold more pure. Consider the same thing is happening for you now. Your home, alone, not alone, but your home, quarantined with your wife, with your husband, with your partner, with your kids, can't go anywhere. You know, you're stuck at home. So consider this as your opportunity to get heated up, metaphorically speaking, so that your imperfections may rise to the surface. So the question mark is what imperfections is the quarantine revealing about you and your marriage? Perhaps it's showing you that you're not very good at collaborating with your partner. Perhaps it's showing you that you and your partner have problems in the sexual arena together. Perhaps it's showing you that you struggle getting a handle on how to parent your kids. What is it for you? Perhaps it's highlighting that you're not a very good listener. Perhaps it's highlighting that you tend to be self-absorbed and you forget about how your partner is doing through this coronavirus crisis. But view this time together, this quarantine, as it's going to heat up everything because this is close quarters. And so be searching for your growth areas. What are your growth areas? What are your marriage growth areas? This is time for those imperfections to rise to the surface so you can identify them. And you want to ask your partner for feedback. So because your partner is in the most unique situation to give you feedback, no one else is with you 24 seven, except for your kids right now. So your partner is in a unique position to give you feedback on your growth areas. What do they see in you? What do they think you could improve in? How do they think you could be a better parent? How do they think you could be a better partner? How often do you ask them those questions? Use this time of the quarantine to allow your partner to speak into your life. It can be scary, but if you don't, they're gonna get fed up and criticize you for those growth areas. So it's much wiser to be proactive and ask them for that feedback proactively. And similar to what I mentioned, so you wanna embrace this opportunity for growth. It's a rare, extremely rare, hopefully once in a lifetime occurrence we're going through where we are with our partner 24 seven. So they're in a heightened, unique position to give us feedback on our growth areas. So take advantage of it, use it, and use this feedback to become a better person, which will make you a better partner. Once you identify where you need to improve as a married couple or you as an individual, then you need to think about what type of resources do you need? Perhaps you need to check out a book or order a book from Amazon. Perhaps you need to start listening to a podcast. I do Marriage Steps podcast. If you go to Apple and just search Marriage Steps podcast, you'll find my podcast as a free resource. But identify where are my growth areas, where are our growth areas, and then reach out for resources. Think about what you need to get better in that. Perhaps you need some tools. I do marriage training modules, and you can go to my website, drwyattfisher.com, click on marriage modules, and each one's on a different tool, so perhaps that's what you need to get better. But to discern and think through what are your top growth areas and what resources do you need to get better, and then get them. Use this time as an opportunity for growth. Okay, so so far we've gone through partitions. Then we talked about exposure, 
and now we're on the A for peace, the acronym peace, and the A stands for anxiety. So some of us are more prone to anxiety than others. This stems from the personality trait neuroticism, which is 50% genetic. So 50% of our genetics will influence how likely it is for us to develop anxiety. Some of us have a strong genetic bent, some of us have a low genetic bent. And then that interacts with your environment growing up, and the more stressful your environment was growing up, the more anxious of a person that probably made you, and vice versa. So all of us are at a different position entering into the coronavirus crisis. And some of us are highly anxious, some of us aren't anxious at all, some of us are right in the middle. I'm somewhere in the middle. I'll have days where I get anxious and I'm like, whoa, what's going on in our world? And then I'll have other moments where I'm not anxious at all. So I'm somewhere in the middle. So when we get anxious, it impacts how we are as a partner. We tend to turn two eyes in where we get self-absorbed and we stop thinking about how our partner is feeling and what's, what they are going through. So on a personal level and for marriage health, it's important for you to learn how to manage your anxiety. So I'm going to go through some steps on how to do that. First thing to consider during this coronavirus quarantine is daily exercise outside. You need to get outdoors, but not within six feet of other people, but you need to get outdoors to so get sunshine on your face, breathe the fresh air, and get some exercise. Exercise is one of the best ways to lower anxiety, so you want to prioritize that daily. Another thing to consider is humor. Humor has a great way of putting things in perspective and lightening us up and helping us relax and it takes the edge off. So in, consider intentionally integrating humor into your life right now. One thing I've been doing with my kids recently is watching the Police Academy series. There was like six Police Academy movies back in the 1980s that I watched growing up. So I've been watching those with my kids and we sit there and we laugh and it's fun. So think about what kind of comedies, movies, could you be watching? Or perhaps look at, on the internet for jokes. Start reading jokes intentionally. Look on the radio for humor programs, for, for comedy. Perhaps go to YouTube and watch comedians. Jim Gaffigan is hilarious and he's very family friendly. And so whatever it looks like for you, but use humor intentionally during this time to take the edge off and to lower your anxiety. Next thing to consider is deep breathing exercises. When we get anxious, our breathing goes to our core and our chest breathing goes, I'm sorry, our blood flow goes to our core and our breathing goes from deep and slow in our belly up to short and shallow in our chest because our body is getting ready for fight or flight. And if you stay in that for too long, you'll experience chronic fatigue syndrome. So you have to focus on your breathing. If your breathing is in your chest and you can tell by watching what part of your body moves when you breathe. If your shoulders are going up and down when you're breathing, most likely you're anxious. So you wanna practice deep breathing exercises. The most simple way to practice this is lay on your back with your knees up at the bottom of your feet on the floor, no pillow under your head. That allows your spine to align, allows your muscles to relax around your shoulders. And then practice breathing in through your nose for five seconds, hold it, then breathe out of your mouth for 10 seconds like you're blowing off hot soup. So in through your nose for five seconds. Hold it. And then out of your mouth for 10 seconds like you're blowing off hot soup. Doing that for several minutes lowers your heart rate, it increases the temperature in your extremities because it maximizes blood flow back out to your extremities, and it calms you down. So if you feel anxious, track your breathing and practice deep breathing exercises. Another strategy to lower anxiety is to compare down, and this refers to thinking of how things could be worse. Now, granted, things could be better. We could be out of our house, you know, the economy could still be thriving. Um, obviously things could be better, but one way to lower anxiety is to consider how things could be worse. So for example, perhaps the grocery stores shut down and there's no food to get. That would be worse. Imagine the gasoline dries up or shuts down and no one can get gas for their cars. 
that would be worse. Things like that. So think about your situation and then consider how things could be worse. That's comparing down. It cultivates gratitude, makes you grateful that things are as good as they still are because they could always be worse. Another way to compare down is to think about other catastrophes. So this link I included here is for the Spanish flu that happened in 1918. Some of you may have been reading about it. That's the most serious pandemic we've ever had in recent history. So that was in 1918, but there's some significant differences. In 1918, the Spanish flu, 50 million people worldwide died, 50 million. So far with the coronavirus, 13,000 people have died worldwide. Huge difference. So yes, this is tragic what we were going through, but imagine living in 1918. And one of the reasons so many people died from the Spanish flu in 1918 is because back then they had no vaccines. They had no bacterial and they had no antibiotics for people to take for infections. So they had no modern medicine like we do today. But today we have top researchers across the planet working on vaccines as we speak. And so just to compare down, and you, you're welcome to click on that link or go to that link to read more about it. Another example of comparing down is, you know, read about past tragedies that were way worse than what we're going through. I just finished a book called Pioneer, and it's an excellent book, and it's about the original colonies. And when they first started moving west, the first place they went to was Ohio. That was considered west back then. And this, the first colony they created on the Ohio River started thriving and they got up to around 300 people but then some type of virus or disease came to that colony and killed about three-fourths of the colony and it was so bad that there's there's diary entries of people you know a woman for example this is one of the things i remember she was at the graveside burying her son she came back to her house and her husband died that's that's how horrible things were for people in the past. So we're not there, obviously. We're not even close to that. So it's just an option. Some people really can benefit from comparing down and compare how things could be worse. Another option for lowering anxiety is embrace the worst case scenario and how you would deal with it. A lot of times we get nervous because we're thinking, oh, I hope that doesn't happen. Oh my gosh, that'd be terrible if this happened or that happened. Instead, try imagining it does happen, and then imagine how would you handle it. So one example is imagine if our quarantine lasts three months, like a long time. Just imagine it's, it's happening, and in your mind, what would you do? How would you respond? How could you survive? How could you even thrive? Because a lot of times we, we get this worst case scenario in our mind and we don't even want to think about it. And because of that, we're held captive to it. But instead, if you can walk into it and imagine it happening, it lowers our anxiety and it makes us feel more prepared for it. Because one of the top causes of stress is a lack of control. This whole scenario of the coronavirus creates a lack of control. But if you can embrace a worst case scenario, whatever that is for you, and then think about how you would respond, that helps you regain a sense of control and that lowers anxiety. Another uh, trick to lower anxiety is you're gonna add the word SO to the beginning of every what if statement. When we get anxious, our thoughts get filled with what if statements. What if this happens? Well, what if that happens? Well, what if this happens? And there we go, what if, what if, what if? And then our anxiety skyrockets. So one simple technique that can be used in this is you wanna counter every what if statement with so what if and then you complete the statement. So here's an example. What if we are quarantined for a long period of time? That's a thought we're probably having, a lot of us. Counter that with, so what if we're quarantined for a long period of time? It's interesting how it changes the perspective. So it goes from what if we're quarantined for a long period of time, panic, to so what if we're quarantined for a long period of time? Now obviously that doesn't always work and that doesn't that's not applicable to every worst case scenario, but a lot of times it can help re reorient our perspective. It helps us shift our perspective to de-escalate the anxiety we're feeling. 
Okay, so on the PEACE acronym, so far we've talked about partitions. That's referring to your time, divide up your time, so all of your needs are met, you and your partner. Then we talked about exposure, and that's referring to using this heating up time in your marriage to expose your growth areas as a person and as a couple, and to dig deep and work through those growth areas so you can become a better person through this time. Then we got into anxiety, and I went through some techniques on how to lower your anxiety, because as your anxiety gets lower you become a better partner the next one in our peace acronym is collaboration so as you know staying home with your partner in these tight quarters it requires a lot of decisions on how to do things most of the time if we're both out working and then we come home we're not together all that much we're usually gone more than we're together but now that we're together with our partner and with our kids 24 7 that requires a lot of decisions all the way from what food should we buy to are the kids allowed to do this are they not to I want to go to I want to do this right now and you want to do that right now what program on TV are we gonna watch all these decisions are skyrocketing because we're together so much more so this step is all about creating collaboration on those decisions so the question mark for you is who calls the shots who calls the shots in your marriage on all these decisions that are coming up? Who calls the shots with how the kids are going to be, be disciplined or how much tech they're going to have? Who decides that? Who decides on, on how much money you're going to be spending on food? Who decides that? Who decides on how often you're going to be connecting and having sex in your marriage? Who decides that? Who calls the shots? Okay, that's the question mark you want to be thinking about. All areas that impact both of you the decision needs to be shared. So for example, if partner A is in charge of all the child care, then they're going to be making the decisions on the child care. However, if both of you are sharing child care and you're taking turns with when you're in charge of your children, then you need to be sharing decision making around your kids because it impacts both of you. So any decision, no matter how big or small, that you're making during this quarantine that's going to impact you as a couple, the decision needs to be shared and if it's not shared resentment will mount because one of you may be a little stronger willed and you want your way and so you push for your way and then your partner gives in but if they give in they're going to resent you so you don't want that you don't want anyone feeling like they're giving in so instead you want to be sharing these decisions so you're both feeling good in your heart and good towards one another with what you've come up with so this is where the tool Bounce the Ball comes in. I've talked about this a lot in my conferences and blog posts and marriage uh, podcast. Basically what Bounce the Ball means is think about sports. Look at this picture here of the basketball. If any of you have played soccer or basketball or watched it, you know everyone hates a ball hog. Okay? We don't like a ball hog. And the ball hog is someone who just holds the ball. Instead, we like the person who passes the ball, who shares that ball, and that is called sharing power. Sharing power occurs when both partners feel like they have an equal voice, when they both feel like what they say matters, when they both feel like they can influence their partner. So you need to be flexible during this quarantine time. Don't get rigid with having things your way, especially if your way impacts your partner. It's going to build res resentment and problems and conflict. But instead, practice bouncing the ball. So how this works is partner A says their position on a topic and the core need under that position, and then they bounce the ball by saying, what do you think? And then the other partner catches the ball, and they say their opinion and the core need underneath their opinion on that topic. And then they bounce the ball right back by saying, what do you think? And at that point, partner A has to shift their position by a few degrees to honor partner B. So now they say their new opinion, and then they bounce the ball and say, what do you think? Then partner B does the same thing. They adjust their position by a few degrees to honor partner A. They say their new position, and then they bounce the ball and say, well, what do you think? And you keep doing that back and forth until you reach a win-win. You want to reach enthusiastic agreement on decisions that impact you as a couple so that you're living harmoniously during quarantine instead of resenting each other because one of you are taking over. Okay, so 
So far, we have covered partitions, which is how to divide your time. We've covered exposure, which is looking for imperfections in yourself and your marriage during this time that can be highlighted and improved. We've talked about anxiety, how to lower your anxiety during this time. And we've talked about collaboration, collaborate on how to bounce the ball so you're working as a team during this quarantine time. So the last letter in our PEACE acronym we've been building here is ENGAGE. So I'm going to walk through some ideas on how to engage your partner during this quarantine time. First thing to consider is that this is a unique opportunity to have more time together. When was the last time you had this much time together with your partner? Maybe never. But when you were dating, most likely, this is what you wanted. You wanted to be with your partner 24-7. Well, guess what? You got it. Now you have to make the most of it because this is a very unique opportunity to build your marriage if you view it that way and if you're working towards building your marriage. So it's a unique opportunity. So the first thing I would encourage you to do is cultivate your daily emotional intimacy. And the tool I recommend on this one is called the head heart check. The head is your agenda. So what's going through your mind? What's your agenda throughout the day? What are the things you have to do, have to accomplish? That's the head. The heart is what are you feeling? So mad, sad, glad, or fear, and why? What are you feeling? Sometimes those feelings are going to be connected to your agenda. Sometimes they're an undercurrent. They have nothing to do with your agenda. And some of us are really good at knowing what we're feeling and some of us aren't. If you're one of those people that don't quite know what you're feeling, that's okay. But I would encourage you to spend some time journaling every day, even for a couple minutes on what am I feeling? Am I mad, sad, glad, or fear, and why? The more you journal, the more practice you'll get on becoming more in touch with what you're feeling, and then you can share more. So you want to have this time twice a day. In the beginning of your day, you want to do your head heart check by asking your partner what's on your head and heart. It takes about five to 10 minutes in the morning, and then you do it again at night, and you follow up. That, that's where your, your 60 minutes of time together at night comes into play, where you follow back up, and you ask your partner, hey, how's that going for you, that thing you brought up this morning? What were your highs? What were your lows? You ask follow-up questions. That's how you cultivate friendship, is you know what's going on inside your partner. So the head heart check is one of the best ways to cultivate that. During this head heart check, don't mention anything negative you're feeling towards your partner. Otherwise, they'll associate it with time to get critiqued. You need to use the floor method for that. And there's a training module on that on my website. If you go to marriage, if you go to marriage modules, click on the module that's about the floor technique because that's a conflict resolution skill. So during this head heart check, you want to keep it clean. It's just anything you're feeling beyond your marriage. You want to share that to cultivate emotional intimacy. Another thing you want to cultivate that I mentioned earlier is a weekly home date. Don't view this quarantine as an excuse for no dates. My wife and I just had a date last night. It can happen. It was at home. And it varies on what you do, but the four top things to consider in your date is a lot of affection, emotional intimacy, which is the head heart check, recreation, which can be card games, board games, darts if you have one at home, or ping pong table if you have that at home, and then something sexual. If you do all four of those, both people will think that was a good date. If you only do half of those, one of you will walk away saying, ah, it wasn't that great. Okay, so you want to cultivate this weekly home date. Maybe you put your kids down early. Maybe they're watching a movie or two movies. You go in your bedroom, you lock the door, and then there's your little chamber to have your home date, whatever that is for you. The last thing to consider here to engage your partner is you want to cultivate physical intimacy. You have a lot of time to be touching your partner right now, okay, in three different ways. The first way is you want to increase your affection. And you want to think about how does your partner like to be touched? Don't make assumptions. Confirm your hypotheses. If you think they love their hair stroked, ask them. And then ask them how much they like their hair stroked, how hard or how light or where on their head. Everyone's different. I've mentioned this before, my wife loves light tickles, just really little light tickles, and I hate tickles. And growing up, my mom was a farmer, she's very firm in her touch, and she'll squeeze, and she'll grab, and she'll, you know, hold real tight. And for years, my wife would say, you never give me affection. And I'd say, what do you mean? I'm squeezing you and holding you tight all the time. And she would say, I hate that. I want light tickles. So don't make assumptions on how your partner likes to be touched, but use this quarantine time to touch them a lot. 
if they like that. Also ask them that, if they like to be touched, if they, if they want more affection and what kind they want. The other physical intimacy to be cultivating is sensual time. So this could be, you know, say three nights a week, something like that would be ideal, where you're having either a shower together or a bath together or this couple here, they're in the jacuzzi together. If you have one of those, that'd be awesome. I don't have one, I wish I did. Um, or you can give each other sensual massage. Okay, sensual massage is one of my favorites. That's what my wife and I did last night for our home date. In the sensual massage, you need to have a giver and a receiver. And the giver, you can just use something like coconut oil that doesn't make a mess. And you just practice touching their and rubbing and massaging their body. This is non-sexual touching. And then your partner who's receiving gives you feedback on what feels good. So they can say, nah, or they can say, mmm, or they can say, nice. If they say nah, that means stop. If they say mmm, that means it's okay what you're doing. But you're shooting for nice. And if you're the receiver, make sure you give a positive redirect. If they're doing something you don't care for, redirect their hand. Show them where you do want to be touched and how you want to be touched and then affirm them, compliment them. Because that's going to train your partner on how to touch you. So during the sensate focus, you want to think about maximizing your five senses. Okay, so you want to maximize your scent. What would you like to be smelling? Your mouth. What would you like to be tasting? Like like dark chocolate or strawberries. Auditory. What do you want to be listening to? Maybe it's flute music. Maybe it's ACDC. I don't know. Your eyes. What do you want to be looking at? How bright do you want it? How dim do you want it? And your touch. What do you want to be touching? What would feel good to your touch? So you want to maximize your five senses. Okay. On the nights where you're both feeling some arousal after your sen sensual time, or you're open to arousal, that's, those are the times you move it up to the sexual tier. And this is coming out of the wedding cake model to sexual intimacy, and I'll be creating a training module on the wedding cake model. But some of you have been to my conferences and you know about the wedding cake model. So on the nights after sensual time, you're both open to arousal, or you're feeling arousal, one or the other, you move it to the sexual tier. Now in the sexual tier, you have options. Some nights you're gonna, this is gonna defer to the lower libido partner. Some nights they may only be open to making out, so that's what you do. Other nights they may only be open to everything above the waist, so that's what you do. Other nights they may only be open to below the waist, so manual or oral stimulation below the waist, so that's what you do. Other nights they may be open to everything, including intercourse, and so that's what you do. So you defer to the lower libido partner for a reason because most lower libido partners fall under obligation sex, which is a killer. It lowers libido. And then your partner's not satisfied either. They don't want your body. They want your, all of you. They want your soul. And so having options, viewing sex as a buffet is huge for marriage. Because when we get married, after a while, it can feel like intercourse or nothing. And for a lower libido partner, often they'll choose nothing because they're not up for intercourse. But if sex can be viewed more as a buffet where you can have drinks or an appetizer or a salad and a main course and a dessert, you have options, then the lower libido partner is much more likely to engage and we want all of them present. So giving options gives the lower libido partner more voice and more choice. And on the nights they're up for intercourse, I always recommend having the female, this is for heterosexual couples, have the female orgasm before intercourse begins because for the majority of females, pleasure goes down after intercourse because there's not enough clitoral stimulation. So those are some ideas to engage, okay? You wanna be leaning into the emotional intimacy, view this as a unique opportunity and practice more touching through the affection, sensual time and sexual time. So those are the acronym. That's the acronym for P. So you want to be thinking about your partitions, how you're going to divide your time so both your needs are met. Exposure, so what growth areas are being revealed and what resources do you need to work on them to get better. Anxiety, think about all the ways you can lower your anxiety that I went through so that you're calmer, so that's going to make you a more effective partner, so you're one eye in, one eye out. Think about collaboration, so of all the areas you're making decisions, if it affects both of you, do not move forward until you're in enthusiastic agreement and then engage. View this time with your partner as a unique opportunity to really improve your emotional intimacy and your physical intimacy. 
So for any other resources you're looking for, you can go to my website on at drwyattfisher.com. So there's lots of resources there. I have a blog, uh, information on my Marriage Steps podcast, my retreats, which I'm not doing right now, but they're coming in the fall, hopefully. You can find out information about that. My practice is in Boulder, Colorado, and so I am offering Zoom sessions remotely for couples who do want marriage counseling right now during this time. Um, so that's an option for you, but you're welcome to check out my website for more marriage resources. My Marriage Steps podcast is a great resource during this time because it's free and you can listen to it from home. So whatever you're doing around the house, you can be listening to it. And over the next few weeks, I'm going to be reviewing these concepts I've gone through today on the PEACE acronym. So it can be helpful review. Um, and there's lots of other topics I cover there. So it's a great way to be learning together as a couple, whether you listen together or listen separately, then come back together and discuss it. But Marriage Steps podcast. And again, if you have an Apple device, click on the purple Apple, I'm sorry, the purple podcast app. And then within there, type the search button, the search, the magnifying glass, and type in Marriage Steps, and you'll see my Marriage Steps podcast, and you can subscribe to it there. Also, follow me on social media if you don't already. I'm on Facebook, and I'm on Instagram, so I tend to post twice a day, six days a week on social media, just daily marriage tips, marriage encouragement, so be sure to be following me on, on those social media accounts so you can be receiving those uh, daily tips. And if anything I've gone through in this marriage survival guide, if you have questions to anything, be sure to email me. My email is right here. So info at drwyattfisher.com. And I hope this marriage survival guide not only helps you get through this quarantine, but helps you thrive during it. Take care.